Chris Downey was at the top of his game as an architect when he lost his sight. But the disability didn't end his career. In fact, he's become a global leader in designing spaces for the blind. Downey is one of the few blind architects in the world. He serves as president of the California Commission on Disability Access. He's worked on a wide range of buildings with a focus on accessibility, the new transit center in San Francisco, and renovations for housing for the blind in New York City are just a couple of his projects. You talk about universal design and creating spaces where you, you can walk into this design and not see that it's designed in a way where everybody can walk through there and not even know that it's designed in a way where if someone's blind, they can make their way through. Um, and, and I think that's kind of at the heart of what you're talking about, you know, bringing the two worlds together in a sense. Um, these kinds of designs are really important. As architects, we tend to underestimate the power of the work we do. And that's not to put it on an egotistical level. Uh, maybe it's more on sort of uh, like, oh, we don't realize it. The power we have over the lives of the people who use the buildings we design or the environments we design, uh, such that the way that we design it, we can either welcome people or exclude people. And there's a lot of talk about inclusive design and there's a lot of interchange between this idea of universal design or is it, is it better called inclusive design? I like inclusive design because you can then easily consider the, the alternative or the opposite of that. If you're not doing inclusive design, what are you doing? Exclusive design? Do you really want to consciously decide to not include these people? If you turn that around and give them a choice, well, the obvious is, no, I don't want to keep anybody out of here. So let me set, step back and set the stage a little bit. Downey became blind in 2008 after an operation to remove a brain tumor near his optic nerve. The surgery was successful. Two days later, my sight started to fail. On the third day, it was gone. That diagnosis that you have a brain tumor, I would think has got to be really scary. And you've talked about losing your father and thinking about mortality and all of that. And I think a lot of people kind of skirt over that and they talk about the vision loss. But that piece, that scary piece, can you talk about that? Yeah, that, that was uh, to have um, a, a diagnosis of a brain tumor, uh, which happened to be something my, my dad had had. And, uh, and then he went for surgery. He was a doctor, he went for surgery and uh, he eventually died from complications from the brain surgery. That was a long time ago, back in the, in the uh, early 70s. A lot has changed since then, but to get a diagnosis of having a, a brain tumor, especially when I look so much like my dad. Uh, I'm about the same height, if, even my mom and my, and my mother, <laughs> my mother and my wife uh, comment on how my hand posture gestures are so much like like my dad and my wife, it's looking at photographs of them and there's so much similarities that uh, it's like, this is a little too close to home. And so that, that first thought was, you know, is this, are we on the same path here? You know, is that the same kind of things? So when facing you know, uh, the surgery, you know, some, some apprehension about it, but confidence. Uh, and, but then when it came down to losing my sight, it made a world of difference because then uh, I actually said to people, that's almost trivial. You know, you know, for my dad, you know, he lost his sight and my, he lost his life. So as a kid, I was seven and he was 36. You know, uh, my son at the time when I lost my sight, he was uh, he was 10 uh, and I was 45. So it's like, OK, things are better. Uh, I'm still here. He still has his dad and we're still here as a family. And then, then it's like, okay, so much about that. Let's get, let's get busy. Let's uh, restore our lives together uh, and restore our way of living and doing things and, and uh, 
having fun together. And I used to, it's like, I've got a second chance to be there as that as a dad for my son. So it's like, let's make the most of it. That's the mental piece that's so key because if you take a different yeah. approach, my life's over, this is terrible, it, it kind of determines your future in a way, doesn't it? I mean, you really kind of, can you talk about that, that yeah. positive attitude and? Yeah, you know, it's this, uh, anything like that. It's a traumatic experience. And the sooner you can be prepared to cope with it, uh, and to, to do the things you need to do. In the case of sight loss, it's rehabilitation for sight loss. It's learning new ways of doing things. You're really dependent on making yourself available to do that. And that can be hard to accept. In my case, it was easy to accept. It's like, it was like, okay, I'm still here. And I wanna, I wanna get out, I, don't wanna, I wanna get back to being an active, dad, an active person in the community. I want to get that out there as quick as possible. So let's get started. Let's get the training. Uh, let's figure it out. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, sometimes I think a lot of it had to be about being trained as an architect and being comfortable with the unknowns and having confidence in that process of if you do the right things, you follow the steps, you do your due diligence, you work at it, you try different things, you experiment, you're not af afraid to fail, uh, and, and just keep progressing, that, that you'll, you'll, you'll make it, and perhaps you'll be surprised with what you find at the other end. I spoke with Dowdy at the Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The nonprofit helped him navigate life after losing his sight. It's great that we're interviewing you here because I know you have genuine affection for this building, not just because of the design, but many more reasons why. Can you talk to us about the lighthouse and what it means to you? Yeah, so the, the lighthouse for the blind and visually impaired is the place that I went to for my rehabilitation training when I first lost my sight. So. Um, this organization, whether it was orientation mobility training, learning how to get around with my king, um, learning all sorts of, of things, working with technology, uh, life skills around the house. But I think even more importantly is the community, to be surrounded by people that understand it, that know how to do things and give you the insider scoop, <laughs> like inside baseball, yeah. get, you, get you inside the game. Uh, and, and get the sort of the tricks, the, the, the strategies, the ways of doing things, and, and just sort of a community that, that understands each other and understand what you're going through. Mm -hmm. What were some of the tools that you developed that helped you uh, with your craft? Well. I don't know that I really developed any tools. I developed different ways of working with things. So uh, the critical thing was an embossing printer, a large format embossing printer, so I could print drawings, uh, architectural drawings uh, uh, that are you know just like any other drawing, drawings that other people are doing. But then needing to sketch on top of that, needing to express ideas. How do you do that? And I can't just take a pencil and draw on top of that. <laughs> I wouldn't know where the line is. <laughs> so yeah, ultimately it came down to so my, my go-to little tool is a kid's craft tool. It's just a, a, they're called wax sticks. And they're, they're really simple. And so it's come out of the box in a, in a line, they're kind of bent or whatever, but you can straighten them out, you can curve them, you can fold them, you can snip them off with your finger. It doesn't take any tools. And as you work with it, since it's wax, they get sticky you could stick it right down in the paper and they just become you know, these accessible tactile lines that I could put on the, on the paper and sketch with them on top of either a blank sheet of paper or on top of an embossed tactile plan. Uh, so that really be, became the way I, I uh, do most of my work. Yeah, you're, you're a problem solver. This is a problem. It's just yeah. a, another hurdle to overcome in a sense. Right. But that's not how everyone sees it because one of the first persons to come in and talk to you was kind of like, Basically saying you, you got to figure out something else with the rest of your life. Yeah, that was astounding. 
it was the day that I had been told the doctors couldn't do anything more to say to restore my sight. And uh, so I was like, the doctors left, you know, left alone to think about that for a couple hours when the social worker came in to, you know, take care of all sorts of things you have to do, paperwork and get you prepare for what's, what you have to do next. And she said, and so looking at your chart, I see here you're an architect, so we can talk about career alternatives. I was like, yeah, <laughs> this hasn't been 24 hours. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, being confronted with people's assumptions, presumptions, uh, whatever, that takes you to this place of, oh, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, can't do this, well, We'll, we'll have to work on what you can do. The San Francisco headquarters of Lighthouse is special to Downey for another reason. He was responsible for its design, putting an emphasis on how space sounds and feels. There's a lot of work that's done with how we designed the acoustics for this place. So, it, it really starts to happen as soon as you come off the elevators into the elevator lobby and you step forward and you can hear how the space opens up when you get out of the elevator lobby. The space is, is uh, wider, the materials are more absorptive, there's less reverberation and it sort of opens up and you can really tell that you've sort of stepped into the, into the lighthouse. And, and the idea was to make this space be sort of uh, exciting and, and here, uh, really think about that experience of people coming here for the first time because they're experiencing sight loss and they might be a little bit yeah. apprehensive and being fearful of what their future is about. Talk to me about some of the features and how important they are. Yeah, well, there's a lot going on here. The, even the idea of the, of the wood was very intentional. Uh, really for the quality of the sound in this environment. If this were a metal stair, that nice little tap would be a clanking sound, <laughs> which wouldn't be very nice. Uh, if you put carpet on it, then you wouldn't hear anything. So it was important to have a solid material that had a nice sound to it when feet hit it or your cane hit it. But then it was important also for people with low vision conditions to be able to see the, the nosings, if we didn't have these stainless steel nosing strips, it would just, if you had a low vision condition, this whole stair could just look like a, a dark block of wood. The handrail was designed not for how it looked, but how, it, it, uh, how your hand would meet it and how, where your thumb would slide in this little notch and that is broader on the bottom of it. It's not just about function. I'm concerned about sort of accessing sort of the delight of architecture, the, the joy of the design, and how do you experience that if, you're, if you don't see it? Yeah, you know, I remember uh, as a young kid reading Helen Keller and just thinking about, God, what, what would that be like, you know, and the frustrations of being born, you know, having these issues and yeah. stuff. Um, and it's one thing to think that when you're reading it and you have sight, but then, you know, here you are almost, you almost have two lives, the life, the life before the surgery and the life after it. Yeah. Uh, how do you view, uh, you know, that and disabilities? And I mean, your whole sensibility has to yeah. change. You know, it's, there are two lives, but there's one through line. You know, there's one me, there's one personality. Uh, my wife will tell you, I have the same bad jokes I have when I was sighted. <laughs> Uh, I always joke that she sent in a long list of things to get fixed while the doctor was doing the brain surgery. Uh, and, and, but I'm, I'm the same person out the other side. And, and it just, there's some of the logistics that change and you definitely learn a lot from that. And, and focusing in on the uh, positive experiences, the, the learnings, the, the new things that you get along the way and new friendships, new people, and building a, a new and expanded community. Uh, that's uh, really wonderful. And that's, that really influences you know, the work I do in architecture and it's changed how I think about architecture and, and how you design for uh, people. And, and it, to me, it's a lot of 
people think you approach accessibility about making the environment, buildings, or whatever accessible to people that uh, have disabilities. And yeah, that's, that's like at its core what it's there to do. But through this experience I've had, I've really been struck by the rich sort of tapestry of people that I've met since I lost my sight that I never knew when I was sighted. And it was through, through my disability that I became part of a blind community that exposed me to a whole set of new people that are just wonderful people, just as people, but also in the work they do, the things they do, the passions they have, how they go about things. And it's like, I want my new friends to meet my old friends <laughs> and mix those together. And other people with disabilities, you, by joining the, the blind community, you also join the disability community, get exposed and build new friendships with people with all sorts of different disabilities, all of which is, makes my life, my experience, my work that much more rich and, and, uh, and fun and, and sort of worthwhile. And so I see that work of, uh, in, my, in, in the work in architecture, not just about creating accessibility, but bringing these communities together. And often it's the architecture that keeps them apart, where they can't be in the same spaces because they are not made. Uh, for that broad uh, uh, diversity of the, of the full human condition. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. Thank you.